Welcome to Hell of Presidents. I'm Chris Wade. And I'm Matt Crispin. And this is Episode 9, Return to Normie Sea. Jazz, flappers, speakeasies, moving pictures, gangsters, your great Gatsby. An era of explosive cultural development that basically creates a recognizable modern pop culture in America. Much rhapsodized, much mythologized, an era of icons that reverberate through our history even now, a cool century later. So many of the cultural artifacts of this era are so deeply ingrained in the American consciousness, they're basically secondhand references. But when it comes to the political history of this time, the only thing we really get between Prohibition and the Great Depression is the dang Teapot Dome. Teapot fucking dome. It's very similar to uh, the Gilded Age uh, when the only things you really learn are these discrete scandals. When the overall story is of uh, just the ov- the rapacious capital control of uh, government, uh, you don't want to tell that story. So you you turn it into a a tale of individual corruption and greed within a system that is caught and driven out to reaffirm the self regulating nature of the system. Even though the reason that things like the whiskey ring or the credit mobilier or the teapot dome happen is because you are in an opponent of unprecedented and unbridled corporate rule. Uh, because while we had that progressive movement. Uh, and that progressive uh, reorientation of authority towards the government, uh, the twenties sees uh, that government going to work at the sole discretion of this now uh, sort of uh, tamed American uh, uh, capitalist ruling class. And so the Teapot Dome uh, is a pretty, in, when you think about how large it looms in the historiography, everybody learned about Teapot Dome. The term is like, Stampede stamped in your head. Yes, you can viscerally remember filling in a little multiple choice bubble that says Teapot Dome next I, to it. I'm deeply immersed in the Teapot Dome scandal, as Milhouse <laughs> tells Bart. <laughs> Milhouse, I found a hive of killer bees. You want to go throw rocks at it? Sorry, Bart. I'm deeply immersed in the Teapot Dome scandal. Huh? It's actually incredibly banal. Uh, uh, Albert Fall, the uh, the Interior Secretary uh, under Harding, uh, takes bribes to let oil men. Uh, drink the milkshake of America's <laughs> uh, uh, national strategic oil reserves at, among others, Teapot Dome Reserve. Uh, and that's basically it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not very interesting. And it stands there because what else are you going to talk about? You're going to talk about the business of America being business? No. You want to tell the story of America as, as institutions de- uh, removed from material considerations. And so uh, the legal and systematic process of capital cult- capture of all state authority carried out in legal cases and regulatory decisions and campaign donations just fades into the background, leaving only the criminal, personal, and non-recurring uh, scandal of Teapot Dome. Now, I mentioned prohibition above because that does also define this age. But prohibition, along with, of course, women's suffrage, are really the capstones of the progressive age. These two monumental social reforms now enshrined in the Constitution, both the product of generations of hard-fought political activism and agitation. And I don't want to downplay suffrage, obviously a triumph of civil rights and a great leap forward in the equality of all people in this country, but I do want to hone in on prohibition because, Matt, goddamn, it is a wild that we made alcohol illegal in this country for a decade. Yeah, it's nuts. Uh, you got you look at when you're looking at the progressive moment, and you're and you're seeing at the one hand what we talked about uh, last week, uh, the uh, creation of this new regulatory state uh, that is regulating capitalism but still facilitating its function. Uh, that function is still creating social dislocation. It's still creating social conflict. It's still riddled with uh, contradictions that are expressed socially. And the uh, suffrage and prohibition can be seen as the political process addressing the symptom, as Mm -hmm. it were, because the imperative of capital cannot be challenged, but uh, it's more uh, publicly conscious. The, The 
negative uh, externalities that are more publicly uh, metabolized must be addressed. Mm -hmm. And prohibition is part of that. Uh, It was a huge victory for the women's rights movement. Uh, Americans at that point drank a staggering amount of alcohol. uh, And alcohol was considered at the time the primary lubricant for uh, the brutal alienation of urban uh, wage labor and its associating poverty, which led to a staggering levels of domestic violence. Uh, it's no coincidence that suffrage and prohibition were acted simultaneously. They were both uh, affirmations of the political subjectivity of women, which was accomplished by activism and the rise of mass consumer culture. They couldn't leave half the population out of the equation of the public. Uh, and it also prohibition marked a new stage of interventionist government tasked with stabilizing family structures and individual levels of indulgence in order to maintain familial and market relationships in a stable condition. And so you see here, dislocation caused by, in, an, in, a, in the modern context of mass culture, which we're finally getting to, right. uh, you are seeing uh, the, the necessity for the political system to address uh, the symptoms of social uh, alienation caused by accelerating capitalism. And they do that by intervening at the social level mm-hmm. because they cannot intervene at the economic level. They're prohibited from intervening prohibited from intervening <laughs> at the uh, economic level and so prohibition is there to to solve the wound the alcoholic mania caused by a increasingly uh, alienated uh, uh, and socially atomized population uh, trying to deal with the uh, realities of the wage relationship and it's and it's alienating effects uh, and it had the knock-on effect of creating a hugely capitalized criminal economy uh, that would go on to serve as a useful extra legal arm of American government. That's not necessarily that it's attended goal, but it proves that even a nev- negative externality can be recuperated into the gr- greater machinery of capitalism. So we progress past the progressive age. At one point, both Roosevelt and Wilson, the progressives, two great avatars were considered possible contenders for the 1920 presidential election. But then Teddy died suddenly. RIP to an actual legend there. Heartbroken by the death of his son on the fields of World War I. And Wilson stroked out of commission. And so both parties turned to that great forge of presidents, Ohio, to pull two candidates out of relative obscurity to rally the country under the banner of, hey, stop doing stuff. Warren Gamaliel Harding. Gamaliel. I'm going to say that middle name one more time. Gamaliel, Gamaliel was born in Blooming Grove, Ohio, on November 2nd, 1865. His father, an abolitionist, was a doctor who eventually acquired a small weekly newspaper, setting young Warren G. down the road of the newspaper game. After attending Ohio Central College, actually, I'm going to take an aside here. I forgot to mention la- last episode, uh, the progressive uh, presidents, the first three string of presidents to all graduate from Ivy's. Mm, interesting. Interesting, right? Yes, as, as the meritocracy that... comes into shape, yeah. you're seeing the need for, uh, if you're going to get the top job, you have to have the top credentials. Yes, it's Teddy from Harvard, uh, Taft from Yale, and Wilson from Princeton. Mm-hmm. Uh, I forgot to put that at the end of the last one, but I think that is emblematic of that era, so I'm saying it now as we talk about the great academic institution of Ohio Central College. <laughs> Uh, no, no, no smoke to Ohio Central Col- College, but uh, figured I'd. Put I'm that, sure it's a fine institution. Yeah, uh, put that Ivy aside here. Uh, after attending Ohio Central College, where he ran a student newspaper, he and his family uh, moved to Marion, Ohio, a town where Warren G. Harding would be associated with for the rest of his life. Warren soon bought a tiny local paper, the Marion Star, and proceeded to grow the paper with the town of Marion itself over the next few decades, owning the paper until the 1920s. He soon turned his eyes to politics, and after a few failed stabs at elected office, got himself elected state senator in 1899. Harding ingratiated himself into all elements of the Ohio Republican Party, though he would lean conservative during the upcoming progressive-conservative split. When the Roosevelt faction bolted against Taft in the 1912 convention, Harding would become one of those giving the nominating speeches for Taft. Taft. He tried to run for governor of Ohio a few times and never quite made it, but continued ingratiating himself to the Ohio Republican machine. In 1914, Harding was pushed by state fixers to run for U.S. Senate in a primary against his old mentor, Joseph Foraker, 
a huge figure in Ohio and national politics at the time, but one representing the waiting generation of Ohio Republicans. You're washed up, old man. <laughs> Hit the bricks. Harding was able to unseat him and become the junior senator from Ohio. He was described as a bit of a lightweight by his colleagues who noted his stump speeches drifted between pandering pablum and nonsense, but he kept his head down in the Senate and made more friends than enemies. He also, maybe airheadedly, maybe strategically, took wait-and-see style votes on tricky issues like suffrage and prohibition, claiming he'd need to wait until Ohio supported suffrage before voting for it. By the time the issue came to the Senate, it was indeed popular with Ohio Republicans, and he took the yes vote. On prohibition, he voted against it at first, then after it passed, voted to overturn Wilson's veto on the Volstead Act, a vote for prohibition enforcement. So we've got here a pure case of a himbo. <laughs> uh, Warren G. Harding is the further a, the furtherance of the uh, rationalization of the Republican machine that Taft had been from Roosevelt, turning uh, this new progressive infused party that is still the party of wall street is still the party of the uh middle class of the north largely sp speaking uh but is now able to operate independent of a um animating charismatic figure uh and harding becomes the presidential nominee because he is inoffensive to all he cannot threaten any he does not represent any faction he does not represent a threat to overawe any individual faction with his charisma or his <laughs> ability uh he is an organization man of the republican party uh, he could be trusted by all in attendance to secure the party's interests and their interests uh and he, he would owe their presidency to them with no ability to uh operate uh, uh from an independent position uh, a perfect candidate for a party that by this point was a well-oiled machine of corporate control, political patronage, and popular support. The Republicans were still the natural ruling party, dominating the electorally decisive northern middle class. After the unpopular entry in World War I and Wilson's botched League of Nations campaign, the Republican electoral appeal was assured. They didn't need heroism or wisdom or ability or experience at the top of the ticket, just a warm body who would do what he was told. <laughs> So I don't think we need to get too deep into the election of 1920 cents. Uh, as Matt just mentioned, both parties are basically flailing at top line leadership levels and end up pulling two different newspaper editors from Ohio for their ticket. Damn. The Democrats were kind of hamstring since Wilson is still in the picture, but basically incapacitated from his stroke. Treasury Secretary William McAdoo emerges as an early front runner. But his pro-prohibition stance, as well as Wilson's meddling in his nomination in hopes it would force the convention to pursue a third term for himself, Wilson, scuttled the McAdoo nomination. So the convention turned to James M. Cox, a newspaper man and then current governor of Ohio, who was a progressive supporter of Wilson. I really only touch on the Dem convention here to set up the importance of prohibition and lack of strong consensus candidates for the much more dramatic 1924 convention, which we will get to in depth in a minute. Meanwhile, the Republicans are still working out their progressive conservative split. The convention largely turns on attitudes towards Wilson's handling of the war and possible membership in the League of Nations. The convention was deadlocked among its most likely nominees, and Harding emerged as a compromise and was nominated on the 10th ballot. One interesting thing here is Harding's nomination is actually the origin of the idea of the smoke-filled room. Mm-hmm. The mystical and, in this case, literal private room the party bosses met in late at night to hammer out a deal between themselves to secure a candidate. Uh, the reports at the time perhaps overplayed the level of elite machinations here, uh, and it has later been suggested Harding's rise had more to do with his uh, personal amiability to party rank and file um, and the Republicans' strong position going into 1920 not demanding a particularly progressive or dynamic candidate. But one way or another, they did get blocked at first. In the convention, and then when the uh, delegates at large couldn't come to a decision, the influential senators got together in a room in the Blackstone Hotel, yes. uh, smoked some cigars and said, hey, what about that amiable dunce from Ohio? And everyone said, good enough. And then that carried the day, not the assemblage of uh, uh, ostensibly uh, uh, sovereign delegates in the convention. But their position would be proven right. While uh, Cox ran around the country doing actual campaigning, Harding ran a classic front porch campaign, sitting in Marion, Ohio, and letting the voters come to him. He emphasized return to normalcy and a range of America first type slogans, 
meant to oppose entry into League of Nations and the fear of foreign domination. After years of war, progressive turmoil, and now a post-war recession, this message took, and Harding won in an absolute landslide. He won 404 electoral votes to Cox's measly 127, carrying the popular vote by a margin of 26.2%, the widest vote margin since James Monroe ran unopposed a century earlier. Harding even picked up Tennessee the first time a formerly Confederate state had gone Republican since Reconstruction. Matt, any thoughts on the arrangement of the parties or the array of their constituencies at this point? Or do you want to save that for the barn burner of 1924? Well, let's just say that Wilson's vision of a Pax Americana was premature, as we said. The Great War had proven that the capitalist states needed to get their act together and operate under supernatural international uh, auspices guaranteed by the United States, but nobody in Europe or the United States was ready to hear that. Uh, and he, Wilson failed because the destruction had not been complete enough in Europe. American investment in the war had not been sufficiently developed. Uh, and most importantly, the majority of American people uh, had been dragged into the war and once it was over, were unified in their desire to avoid further foreign entanglements. And the Republicans were able to run on a return to normalcy, a word they invented, by the way. Yes. Uh, normal, normalcy is, was not a word before they decided to use it for uh, that campaign by pledging isolationism overseas and a focus on economic development at home. The frontier might be closed, but the new frontier of the stock market would be where the American dream of self-sufficiency could still be realized. Also, uh, the vice president uh, on the ticket with James M. Cox was a young New York governor named Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who we might hear more of later. Hmm. So we'll kind of speed through Harding because, um, well, he's not around that long. Harding pursued tax cuts for high earners and a removal of the wartime excess profits tax, which were passed after some congressional compromises. Uh, Though generally pro-business, Harding negotiated some compromise resolutions to coal strikes and railroad strikes, as well as used his public pressure to help secure an eight-hour day for steel workers. Harding also made overtures to black voters, advocating for equal political rights in speeches, speaking out against the Tulsa race riot, and advocating for anti-lynching legislation. Uh, But when rubber hit the road, the anti-lynching bill was abandoned in favor of pursuing a ship's subsidy bill Harding favored, which was ultimately filibustered. And I just want to say, if you're looking to uh, secure a uh, historical legacy, I would advise not uh, tossing out civil rights legislation to get boat subsidies passed. (laughs) But the boats, the beautiful boats. The beautiful boats, no. Uh, That's a fuck up, Harding. As part of the return to normalcy, Harding also pardoned a number of political dissidents who had been jailed for speaking out against World War I. This included, of course, the boy, Eugene Debs, who had famously run against Harding from jail as a socialist in 1920. 3% of the vote. Come on. They were getting there. <laughs> Just keep pecking away at it. Slow and steady wins the winner. Win, or I guess doesn't win the race. Never mind. <laughs> Lack of economic improvements got the Republicans rinsed in the 1922 midterms. And in 1923, Harding set out on a voyage of understanding, traveling across the country and even up to Alaska, the first president to visit there, giving speeches and bloviating Uh, the Ohio term for speaking at length without saying anything. In fact, his opponent, William Gibbs McAdoo, described Harding's style of speaking as, quote, the impression of an army of pompous phrases moving across the landscape in search of an idea. Fucking owned, by the way. (laughs) Jesus, how did he come back from that one? So, yes, Harding was on this tour, bloviating and uh, marching his pompous phrases across the land in search of an idea to the American people. Dealing with the fallout of the Teapot Dome scandal, which was threatening to engulf the entire White House. Uh, When, on August 2nd, 1923, while his wife Florence read him a flattering profile of himself titled, quote, A Calm Review of a Calm Man, which sounds (laughs) riveting, Harding suffered what appears to be a heart attack and died. Unless Florence killed him. Calvin Coolidge became the sixth vice president to succeed into the presidency. Rip Warren G. All right, no, let's not end on a somber note. Let's do the sex and scandal and stuff. Oh, baby. One thing, first thing about Harding, horny. (laughs) Wildly horny, loved to do horny stuff. Uh, uh, Conceived a child in the Senate cloakroom. Uh, uh, And not just horny, also a a general uh, 
lover of life. Uh, during Prohibition, he had a whiskey fueled poker games in the White House. Uh, uh, he exchanged horny love letters with uh, uh, with his uh, paramour Carrie Fulton Phillips uh, in Marion, Ohio. Can I read some yes. of these horny? Love oh, letters? let's hear them. This is uh, from the desk of President Warren G. Harding. Well, this is from, was before he was president, but this is uh, his prose. I love your poise of perfect eyes when they hold me in paradise. I love the rose your garden grows. Love seashell pink that over it glows. I love to suck your breath away. I love to cling there long to stay. I love you garbed but naked more. <laughs> love your beauty to thus adore. I love you when you open eyes and mouth and arms and cradling thighs. Oh, baby. If I had you today, I'd kiss and fondle you into my arms and hold you there until you said, Warren, oh, Warren, in a benediction of blissful joy, I, rather like that encore, discovered in Montreal. Damn. That's a horny love letter. I love you. You love me. <laughs> Going down the sugar tree. <laughs> and we'll go down the sugar tree. That's fucking great, man. Did you write that? Yeah. I write songs, too. Uh, yeah. Impregnated with a woman in the cloakroom. Uh, she wrote a tell-all about it. Nan Britton. Uh, at the time, and all of the, uh, the, the, warring, uh, the Warren G. Harding uh, uh, you know, legacy protectors denied it fiercely. Uh, but in 2015, DNA pr- evidence proved that he had fathered the woman from the cloak room's uh, child. Yeah, and that was all hovering around him at the time, in addition to the other part of him, horny, ribald, ribald gentleman, also incredibly corrupt. As you can yes. imagine, he's in it for the dames, he's in it for the whiskey. Of course, he is going to be boughtable. That's why they gave him the job. That's why the smoke-filled room gave him the job. And the, the, the signal corruption was, of course, the Teapot Dome scandal. Uh, uh, and... There was, uh, but in addition to that, you had his uh, political fixer, Attorney General Harry Daughtry, implicated in the little greenhouse on K Street scandal, where he's just accepting payoffs from bootleggers right Mm -hmm. out in the open. Uh, He was indicted, but not convicted in a conspiracy to defraud the government case over transferring ownership of a German-owned metal company to Americans. Uh, And uh, in addition, Harding's Secretary of the vet of uh, his veteran secretary Charles Forbes uh, was convicted of defrauding the government by securing over overpriced contracts and splitting profits. Can you imagine anyone in government doing that? <laughs> but all of these things were around Harding. His his presidency was scandal plagued when he did everybody uh, the decency of keeling over from that quote unquote heart attack, which to this day some people put uh, at the feet of his wife Florence, who was. Finding out, as with everyone else, just how horny her husband was. Uh, is there any detail of like how she would have simulated a heart attack, like poison? I mean, or the CIA has a heart attack gun. Well, this was come on, nineteen twenty-three. Har- yeah, but like, how, you know that the CIA heart attack gun doesn't run on some like high tech shit. It's like some beetroot or like bark that they just shaved off and put into a pellet. She probably she had old Ohio folk wisdom. If you get, <laughs> your husband's being too much of a pill, just put this. Mash this up, put it in a in a in a pie. Read him a read him a profile about himself, and then he'll just go off to sleep. Well, there's no proof of that, but it would would certainly be um, in keeping with with the scandal prone White House of of Warren G. Harding. Indeed. So basically, immediately after his death, Harding's reputation begins to crumble into dust, as he was quoted saying about his time in office, "quote I'm not fit for this office, and never should have been here." <laughs> You love to see it in the hu- in the in the pantheon of presidential qu- quotes. Damn, dude, this sucks. I gotta say, guys like that, I always respect. The same thing as Ambrose Burnside. Yeah, when they tried to promote him to head of the Army of, of the uh, Potomac, he said, "I'm warning you, I will fuck this up." <laughs> well, let's see if good old Silent Cal can pick up the pieces. John Calvin Coolidge Jr. was born on the 4th of July, uh, our only president, born on the 4th of July in 1872 in Plymouth Notch, Vermont. His family were old line New Englanders with relations going back to the original Massachusetts Bay Colony, and his father was a respected farmer and member of the Vermont state government. Calvin attended Amherst, then moved to Northampton, Massachusetts, 
where he read law with a local law firm and became a lawyer in 1897. And as an aside, uh, Coolidge would be the last lawyer president who read law under an established lawyer rather than attending law school for his credentials. Coolidge became involved in the local Republican politics, winning elections to Northampton City Council, then city solicitor, and then getting appointed the clerk of courts. In 1904, Calvin Coolidge lost election for Northampton School Board, his only electoral defeat in his life. Coolidge then became a state rep, then mayor of Northampton, then state senator, eventually becoming president of the state senate. Coolidge stuck with the Republicans during the progressive split and became increasingly popular in state Republican politics. He was elected lieutenant governor in 1915 and eventually governor in 1918. As governor, Coolidge gained national reputation for his handling of the 1919 Boston police strike. Boston policemen had been issued a union charter by the American Federation of Labor, causing Boston Police Commissioner Edwin Curtis to suspend the union leaders for insubordination. The majority of Boston police then went on strike, instigating a tense situation in which Boston Mayor Andrew Peters called in the National Guard and removed Curtis from duty. Coolidge intervened, sending in further National Guard, reinstating Curtis and allowing the firing of all striking police and a new force to be recruited. After publishing a response to AFL leader Samuel Gompers over the issue, Coolidge became a national figurehead for conservative Republicans, and this notoriety would propel him to be nominated for vice president under Harding. In the early morning of August 3rd, 1923, a messenger found Coolidge visiting his family in Plymouth Notch, Vermont, and informed him of Harding's death. Coolidge dressed, met with the assembled reporters, and his father, a notary and justice of the peace, administered the presidential oath of office. Then Coolidge went back to sleep as president. Coolidge was set about methodically addressing the unwinding scandals of the Harding administration, allowing congressional investigations where necessary and removing officials like Attorney General Doherty, who refused to comply, while largely continuing Harding's political... Coolidge is somewhat notoriously known as a bore, the whole uh, silent cow thing. Upon learning of his death, Dorothy Parker would say, how could you tell? But a lot of it comes through as more of a weird sense of humor to me, like uh, when he asked why he kept attending fancy DC dinner parties if he always looked so bored and uncomfortable. Coolidge uh, apparently replied, gotta eat somewhere. Uh, Coolidge is also known for his long list of presidential pets, a bunch of dogs, a thrush, a goose, two raccoons named Rebecca and Reuben. He was even given some lying cubs that he named Tax Reduction and Budget Bureau. Uh, so I'm thinking this guy is a bit of a joker. Yeah, he's got a few tricks up his sleeve. <laughs> but anyway, let's get to something genuinely rip-roaring. The 1924 Democratic Convention. Oh, baby. So here we see the tensions within the Democratic Party uh, finally coming to a head. Now, since the Civil War, the Democratic Party had, at its, at, at its grassroots, been a coalition between Southern white Protestants and Northern urban ethnic catholics irish german mm -hmm. italians later uh but and that formed the basis of uh their cooperation uh, uh whites pursuing racial domination in the south uh northern catholics pursuing uh jobs through the patronage systems of the urban machines uh and for the most part that worked out there was very little conflict even though of course there's a lot of cultural difference between these two groups it never really became an issue uh before the united states stitched itself into the uh the mass culture that it became in the 20th century uh and Cultural conflict had, ob had also been sublimated by opposition to the Repu to Republican rule, uh, and there had been some shared interests. They, they both groups hated the tariff. Uh, gro both groups were uh, invested in maintaining the color line to stave off uh, the prospect of immiseration. Uh, but uh, and the, hom the homogenization of politics that came out of the progressive era had both parties signing on to a middle-class-led rationalization of government relationship to the economy, uh, meaning that other interests rose to prominence in the minds of voters. If we weren't going to be able to vote on things like the tariff mm -hmm. and the money supply, we right. were going to have to vote about something. <laughs> and that something became more, uh, more culturally relevant in a, a world where culture was closer, where the, there wasn't as much uh, distance in the mind between a, a, share, a white sharecropper in the South uh, and a, a Catholic uh, laborer in the North. Uh, and the technological, demographic, and economic convulsions of the 20s led to a cultural reaction 
that was meant to uh, secure existing identities and social structures. And part of that was the uh, the rise of the second clan. Uh, And with that, prohibition. We talked about how prohibition was a victory for uh, women's rights. It was also a victory for rural Protestants who saw uh, John Barleycorn as uh, the (laughs) the cause of many uh, otherwise good Christians' descent into sin and supported prohibition as a way to maintain the social structures that they uh, wanted to see defended against encroaching modernity. And so prohibition was embraced with full fervor by the Klan, and Southern evangelicals in general saw it as a moral good, meant to reduce the malign influence of the cities and the lure of a consumer intoxication away from the old truths of the Bible and homestead. But in the cities, where the homestead was a one-bedroom apartment, taverns and beer gardens were a crucial feature of Irish and German immigrant culture. Uh, This cultural conflict, rooted in religion and geography, had been latent in the Democratic coalition since the days of Van Buren. But the accelerating pace of social change during the early 20th centuries brought it to a head. So in 1924, when the Democratic Party comes to uh, nominate a presidential candidate uh, in in New York City, they are divided between rural Protestant tries and urban Catholic wets over the question of the nomination because the urban Catholic wets were united behind the candidacy of progressive New York governor Al S- and Irish Catholic Al Smith, uh, who was committed to overturning prohibition at the earliest convenience. Opposed against him were the forces of William McAdoo, who had been thwarted in his uh, search for the nomination t- 1920, uh, uh, and who, while himself not a uh, overt Klansman, was happy to uh, accept the support of the Klan. And when these two forces came together, uh, there was, as you could imagine, sparks that flew, because part of the uh, Klan hierarchy was a uh, revulsion towards Catholics and a fear of papal authority coming mm-hmm. in the form mm-hmm. of, uh, of European immigrants from Catholic countries. Uh, and so... The uh, social conflict at the heart of the Democratic coalition came to literal blows in New York uh, when the vote between McAdoo and Smith was indecisive over the course of 107 ballots, Uh, two weeks of constant voting, constant uh, marching through the streets, fist fights, Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, eventually the intervention of William Jennings Bryan in the form of a uh, telegram that he uh, read uh, over the radio to the convention telling them to settle the fuck down. Uh, and it became known as the KKK convention because the Klan did demonstrate in front of the uh, fucking uh, convention center. Uh, and there was a battle over an anti-KKK plank uh, mm-hmm. in the party platform. Uh, but in the end, uh, the passions around McAdoo representing Southern Protestants and Smith representing Northern Catholics was too much, and everyone got exhausted, and on the 108th ballot, nominated uh, compromise candidate from West Virginia, John W. Davis. Uh, And meanwhile, in Cleveland, the Republicans get together for an absolutely sedate coronation of (laughs) Coolidge, uh, who then goes on to absolutely murk uh, Davis in the 1920. Uh, for a uh, 1924 election. And you can kind of see this as a high point for American conservatism before Great Depression. Both parties nominating candidates in favor of lower taxes, decreased regulation, uh, coming from their party's conservative wing, the the working class been scattered and destroyed by World War I and its aftermath, uh, the, the prosperity of the 20s buying off many other people mm-hmm. who would otherwise be alienated, uh, and and a, a a return to a sort of gilded age corporate consensus now being managed by the the progressive state. Yes, indeed. At the aftermath of this uh, convention and electoral defeat, the uh, you know the northern uh, pro drinking Catholics have to be saying sorry for party rocking. <laughs> So yes, in the end, the battle over the Democratic nomination only served to divide the party further. Coolidge was cruising on an improving economy and his seen as honorable handling of the various scandals of the Harding administration. His campaign slogan was, keep cool with Coolidge. Oh yeah. And the nation did. Uh, In an absolute blowout, the Democrats were able to win only the former Confederate states plus Oklahoma, 
receiving only 28.8% of the popular vote. Oof. Their lowest percentage ever. Ouch. So now, Coolidge gets a term on his own right. On January 25th, 1925, Coolidge was quoted in a speech saying, The chief business of the American people is business. And baby, business was good. Under both Harding and Coolidge, unrelentingly pro-business commerce secretary Herbert Hoover had pursued stripping down the regulatory state until it was, quote, thin to the point of invisibility. Taxes were reduced to the point that only the wealthiest 2% of Americans paid any amount of income tax. Here's Coolidge himself on it. When the government affects a new economy, it grants everybody a life pension with which to raise the standard of existence. It increases the value of everybody's property, raises the scale of everybody's wages. One of the greatest favors that can be bestowed upon the American people is economy in government. The post-war recession continued to unwind, and this is the period of the Roaring Twenties. Everybody's doing the Charleston and drinking bathtub gin and buying new cars and seeing moving pictures and building Art Deco buildings and Wall Street's doing its first to the moon as the U.S. became officially the richest country per capita in the world. Oh, baby. So at this point, the the laborers of, of the world, the, the, the erstwhile yeomen of America, had uh, failed to come together into any sort of self-conscious force that could oppose uh, the drift towards corporate uh, power. Uh, the the progressive movement happened uh, as a negotiation between the middle and upper classes with very little import from the the workers, uh, and so that that uh, predictably meant that the progressive state bent in the twenties towards the interests of capital after the breaking of the working class movement after World War II. Uh, but that didn't mean that there was not still a deep sense of social dislocation and alienation that mm-hmm. come from accelerating capitalism. It is always the case, uh, and now for the first time the Yeoman dream was really being annihilated. Mm-hmm. There was no longer a realistic offer to the young up and coming American that they would be able to opt out of the labor relationship and the market economy by self sufficiency on the land. Right. It was no longer really possible. The city was not, people were now moving to the cities from the countryside. It took less hands to work the land. That meant people were being thrust into market relationships. And that caused, as it always does alienation, anxiety, a loss of control, uh, uh, a collision of cultures. Uh, but at this point, the mechanism for soothing that alienation went from uh, the distribution of land to consumption of uh, the products, the fruit of this new uh, industrial economy mm-hmm. that was able to supply labor-saving devices and conveniences right. in a way that it never could before. Uh, and it was that bargain that everyone took not as a overt act of giving up their autonomy as the only offer on the on the books there was no other pole of politics other than the capitalist one and so the, both parties were able to agree to a policy of maximizing consumption which had the benefit of uh heating up the economy and mm-hmm. creating uh markets for its products uh and also had the uh result of demobilizing the American population away from their senses of alienation and exploitation because now they can consume. And not only can they consume, there is now a new dream of, of uh, being liberated from the wage relationship that is no longer connected to the land. Financialization has reached the point where now stocks offer the opportunity to dream of liberation from the market because the 20s is the, is the age when stock ownership becomes democratized and it is stock ownership that fuels the roaring 20s and that is uh the the capitalist state uh uh, achieving a democratic consensus around giving up liberty Mm -hmm. giving up control of one's destiny in the and handing it over to employers and and uh and the wage relationship in exchange for an increased capacity to take that money you're getting for working and spend it on things that make your life easier and more fun. And that is, uh, that's what makes the 20s roar. And it resolves a lot of the contradictions of the state that appeared to be overturning it in the, twi- in the, in the uh, era uh, before the progressive movement. We now have synthesized a new citizenship 
defined by consumption. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for a while, it looks like it's going great. And it looks like <laughs> well, this probably we, forever, we have right? a new thing. I mean, obviously, there's still mass dispossession and misery, but it is at the at, away from centers of political influence. It's among subject class, racial classes like Southern and now Northern blacks uh, and recent immigrants uh, uh, and, and the unfortunate. But at, at the center of American politics, there is a promise of continued uh, 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 convenience, technological consumption. Uh, in the, I mean, you can buy a car for God's yes. sake now. Uh, but and also with the stock market, the dream of one day being rich yourself. Yeah, and I mean, going back to our very first episodes, we talk about how um, liberty in America is uh, defined as property or the ability to own property. And in the 19th century, that property is very literally like land and stuff. And here we see that switch to actually being able to consume liberty as as a form of consumption. Yes. Uh, but as you also referenced there, there is, you know, this alienation has to go somewhere. Yes. And one of the places that it goes at this time is against immigration. Uh, even as prosperity grew, nativism was also on the rise. Anti-immigration sentiment grew with broad support. Uh, from the anti-Catholic KKK to Sandal- Samuel Gompers, who was the Jewish head of the AFL, who wanted to prevent cheap labor uh, in America and was thus uh, anti-immigrant, to outright ethnic Puritans like the West Coast Yellow Perilous and Senator David Reed, who told the Senate he was, quote, interested in keeping American stock up to the highest standard. And by stock there, he's talking about uh, people. Yes, racial stock. Racial stock. They love talking like that yeah. back then. And in 1924, Coolidge had signed a new immigration act, severely limiting immigration from Southern Europe and Asia. So this is what happens when you have capitalist alienation accelerating as, as capitalism infiltrates all levels of life, overturns all fantasies of uh, self-sufficiency. Uh, but cannot be expressed politically because the uh, mechanisms of class uh, uh, political expression don't exist yet. The, the labor movement is at a nadir. And that means that the gap will be filled by the political class, who, of mm-hmm. course, will only ever direct the public ire away from legitimate sources. And so immigrants become the scapegoat. Uh, and and the, uh, the KKK is part of that and the raft of anti-immigrant legislation, all part of a desire to create a narrative around uh, uh, foreign infiltration as cause for the misery that is really being caused by capitalism and then uh, having it ratified by people who really don't have another explanation that they can act on. Finally, on the foreign front, Coolidge presided over the Dawes Plan, providing relief for Germany from their immense World War I reparations obligations and locking America into a kind of circular trade. America would heavily invest in German industry, which then paid off reparations to the Allied powers, who then paid off their war debt to America. That's the important thing. We're talking about this new stock market, this Mm -hmm. new popular prosperity. It's all in the context of America as global creditor, a situation created by World War I. Dawes plan one of the cheap things you might get on a history test from this era. The other one is the Kellogg-Briand Pact. Oh, yeah. Signed between the United States, Germany, France, and other Allied powers pledging to, quote, condemn the recourse to war for the solution of international controversies and renounce it as an instrument of national policy. So, a pact to outlaw war, but without any enforcement mechanisms. We'll see how that holds up. Yeah, what you see in the 20s and 30s is this situation where the imperatives of a global capitalist order are very clear to all, but the political uh, situation in the countries uh, just doesn't support them. Uh, The United States at this point is very dedicated on the left and right to a course of isolationism because they had participated in what everyone understood at some level as a grotesque uh, exercise. No one believed that we fought World War I to defend democracy. (laughs) Uh, There was even a committee in the U.S. Congress to that commission, the Nye Committee, uh, which uh, occurred in the 30s. Uh, to find out exactly why World War One happened, it came to the conclusion: Oh, it's because we we lent a lot of money to British <laughs> bankers, and this was all understood at the time. Right, and that meant that uh, even in the face of the gathering storms of of, of new, renewed violence in Europe, there was not the uh, sufficient uh, 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 mechanisms to uh, build a international uh, check on it, and so we just ended up drifting towards this thing, uh, thinking, you know what, there's even though the uh, capitalist powers of Europe are still there, 
still have military capacities, still have opposing aims, mm-hmm. and are in, in competition for resources as they were before the war, we'll figure it out. We'll, <laughs> we'll, 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 uh, we'll have a pact that we'll all sign, and then we'll look at it and be like, well, we would be dishonorable to start a war now. <laughs> While on vacation in South Dakota during the summer of 1927, Coolidge released a typically to-the-point statement that said simply, quote, I do not choose to run for president in 1928. A man has got to know his limitations, and Calvin Coolidge must be saluted as one who did. Yes. Uh, yeah, reading more into it, he was basically like, yo, I, they got me here in 1920 to be his vice president. I was only planning on staying for like four years, and if I run again, I'll be here until 1930. That just seems like a it, lot of work, it man. Didn't get a, it, like, this is another person who was moved through the system like a, like a piece of bolus in a, in a, in a digestive system, yeah. not someone who was... Is, charting a course heroically uh we can kind of speed run through the rest of the decade here the economy is booming in 1928 the democrats basically know they're going to lose lacking significant material or constituent changes despite the drama and tension of the 1924 convention this time good old al smith gets the nom on the first ballot oh snap for the republicans despite coolidge's somewhat surprised decision not to run commerce secretary hoover was nominated also on the first ballot the Republicans again won in a landslide, and though Democratic votes increased in many places, Smith lost all but eight states, those being the Deep South plus the heavily Catholic Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And it's interesting to point out here that after, four years after fistfights on the floor over this, these questions of identity and, and, and religion, mm-hmm. uh, a Catholic just next four years takes the, takes the nomination on the first ballot, and even though... His Catholicism is a huge issue in the campaign. We'll have some details on that in a second. Uh, and uh, at one point, he was in a campaign car uh, through Long Island, and was it was the, the path of the night was lit, lighted by burning crosses. Uh, he still secured the Deep South. Mm-hmm. Those were the people who stuck around, and of course, the the Catholics in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, which really shows that even though at this point the center of gravity of the electoral Democratic Party is still in the South. Uh, the leadership, the influence, the organization, the momentum is very much on the side of the urban Catholics, which becomes very important uh, during the Great Depression. Herbert Clark Hoover was born in West Branch, Iowa, on August 10th, 1874, to a Quaker family who was the son of a blacksmith. He was sent to live with his uncle in Oregon, where he dropped out of formal education to work in his uncle's office. He was a member of the first class of Stanford University, where he studied geology and managed both the baseball and football teams. Nerd. Yeah. Managed. Managed. Teams. Both of them. Boy. Right up. Oh, boy. What a <laughs> dork. <laughs> After working low-level mining jobs in the Sierra Nevadas, he got hired by a British company administrating gold mines in Australia. He proved adept at the job opposing minimum wage and workers' comp and bringing in Italians to the mine to undercut Australian wages. He was, I I don't know many details here, but he was almost assuredly on some deep Mad Max shit in these Australian gold mines in the the, the late 19th century. Do not become addicted to the Vegemite. (laughs) He was then deployed to China and around the world until the mining company was put under investigation by the British government for fraud. Hoover became a sought-after consultant for mines around the world, helping develop zinc operations in Australia, silver, lead, and zinc operations in Burma, and copper operations in Russia. By 1914, he was a millionaire. When World War I broke out, Hoover was living in London with his wife, Lou. He helped arrange the evacuation of some 100,000 Americans stranded in Europe and was then tapped by Congress to help arrange relief to Americans abroad, beginning his political life. He helped arrange food relief for Belgium after it was invaded by the Germans, crossing the North Sea over 40 times to meet with Germans uh, while doing so. As America entered the war, Wilson appointed Hoover to head the U.S. Food Administration, helping America meet its food needs during the war. He worked managing the food supply not only for Americans, but for the whole Allied supply chain, gaining him acclaim as a master of efficiency in administration. Continuing to mobilize food relief even after the war, Hoover arranged aid to both Germany and the newly Soviet Russia, despite opposing the Bolsheviks, saying, 20 million people are starving. Whatever their politics, they shall be fed. So good on you there, Hoover. At this time, Hoover was seen as a progressive darling, advocating minimum wage, an eight-hour workday, higher taxes, and opposing the harsh measures by Attorney General Palmer during the Red Scare. 
Hoover, until then publicly politically uncommitted, put his support behind the Republicans, seeing the Democrats having a weaker position in the 1920 election. Though he failed to make much headway in the 1920 Republican nomination, for supporting Harding, he was rewarded with Secretary of Commerce. Hoover threw himself into this role, expanding the role of the office and designing policies to promote growth, efficiency, infrastructure investment, and to better manage national resources. Hoover also shaped the early growth of the radio, film, and automotive industries. Automotive specifically, he basically got all the auto industry folks into a room and was like, standardize this. So all the ways modern life is currently dominated by infrastructure catering to cars and cars alone, uh, Blame can go back to Hoover on that one. Yay! Way to go, buddy. <laughs> Fucking asshole. So that takes us up to Hoover taking the presidency. Accepting the Republican nomination for president in 1828, Hoover said, We in America today are nearer to the final triumph over poverty than ever before in history of this land. We shall soon, with the help of God, be in sight of the day when poverty will be banished from this land. Can't wait. On Thursday, October 24th, 1929, at the opening bell, the stock market lost 11% of its value. Oy. The following Monday, it lost 12.82%, and Oy. that Tuesday, another 11.73%. Almost a quarter of its value gone in just two days. Begun, the Great Depression had. Okay. So we can we know now that by 1920 uh 29 the vision of America as a republic of producers was dead. And the 20s had inaugurated the consumers republic. The vision of self-sufficiency and mastery of work would be replaced by a vision of labor-saving technology and creature comforts rendering the conditions of one's labor less and less central to one's concerns. The site of political contest shifted from the workplace to the dinner table. From the 20s onward, the social disruption and anxieties and alienation caused by global capitalism's inexorable proletarianization of the erstwhile yeomanry will be soothed by access to technological conveniences and opportunities for consumption. The frontier had been closed. America's experiment in global leadership had ended in a fiasco. But the dream of ever-expanding wealth in a no longer expanding country needed to be sustained, and the stock market provided the mechanism. The 20s saw a huge explosion in industrial consumption and production across all sectors, but wages, thanks in part to the rout of socialism and organized labor after the war, were low. Debt and stock speculation provided the means for regular Americans to live the mink stole and flagpole sitting lifestyle of the period. <laughs> Stock rises spurred further stock rises. Commercial banks invested their customers' money in the stock market. People took out on debt at low interest rates to buy stocks, although you could, always, you could also buy on margin, essentially betting that the price would only go up. You could also uh, go into debt to buy a new car or radio. But all this speculation was premised on unlimited upward growth. But the real conditions of the American economy as marked by things like wages and debt were creating a crisis of overproduction. Mm. At the same time, commodity production in America's great breadbasket was subject to the same cyclical overproduction that had always been the hallmark of commercialized agriculture. By, the early, by early 1929, the stock market was showing signs of instability as people began to struggle to find places to put their money. Then a glut in the wheat market in the summer of 1929 that devastated farmers and commodity speculators provided the first big jolt to the system. A fraud-based collapse in the British stock market in September jolted confidence further. Slowly at first, then all at once, the willingness of participants in the speculative economy to continue to buy was broken. Unlike the crashes of the 19th century, which were usually the result of a disruption of European investment in American bonds, the 29 crash, happening after the United States had leapt ahead of Europe in wealth, was a homegrown loss of faith. Because of so many retail investors had purchased their stock on margin or with borrowed money, because so many banks had put the money of their customers in the stock market, the loss of value echoed through the entire economy. Even if you had never put a dime in the stock market, there was a good chance your bank had, which meant that whatever money you had trusted them with was gone. The credit-fueled spending that had propelled the American industrial economy through the 20s evaporated, leaving a population far too poor in real money to afford to continue their, consumption, their consumer habits and created a massive crisis of overproduction. Wow, that's, uh, that's good on the Great Depression, you know? It's one of those things where you're like, and then the Great Depression happened, and then and you're like, how? how? Well, it's overproduction. Yeah. Marx, it's, it's, it, that's why Marxism is so fun. It's overproduction. Why mm -hmm. does it do it? Because it can only plan so far, and eventually you've bought all the TVs, you've bought all the uh, Model Ts, you've bought all the Petty Fours you can, but they're still making them. Mm -hmm. And then that causes a collapse. And so Hoover, 
this master of expansion and efficiencies and competent markets. He gets in there and this enormous bomb shattering all these things just goes off in his face. And this is a prime example of a president operating using the tools they, their supporters, their constituency, and their backer have provided them with only to find themselves utterly constrained against the material events around them. Hoover really is the ultimate refutation of technocracy as a guiding ethos. Mm -hmm. Uh, Hoover is the ultimate NGO guy, which we still have. To this day, uh, in the absence of uh, revolutionary politics, there is this naive liberal faith in uh, non-governmental expertise Mm -hmm. to overcome uh, intractable political and economic problems. And in Hoover, you have the ultimate technocrat, a person who had who was truly a logistical genius, who had shown that, who had been instrumental in saving millions of lives in Russia and elsewhere in his work with the Red Cross. Uh, But that machine, that technocratic machine of competence, was powered by a a software premised on uh, capitalist notions, Mm -hmm. premised on capitalist distribution of resources, codified through the American constitutional order. Uh, his position in power was only secured by uh, his, uh, his, the collegiality he had ideologically with everyone else in the Republican Party and in the American political system, uh, a system who all ratified the exact same idea. And so when the Republican Party and the person of Hoover was confronted with the unprecedented crisis of the Great Depression, he was fundamentally incapable of addressing it. Now, this had happened, of course, before in American history, it was every 20 years, basically. We've yes. gone through it already. You could wind your watch by the crisis of overproduction in the American economy. And in every case, the president was able to do what Hoover wanted to do, which is wait it out. Wait out the business cycle. But so what, white, white knuckle it through this yep. one. Uh, but what had changed is, is that by the 1920s, uh, by the late 1920s, uh, the growth, growth of population, urban density, mass culture, working class uh, organization in the form of labor unions and labor networks and p- uh, political structures related to those networks was such that rather than just take it on the chin as previous generations of workers had when the, the economy collapsed, there was now uh, a machinery to articulate mm-hmm. a working class demand for things to be better. And, and they would not take, well, this is just the way it happens as an answer because they had to live with the, with the suffering. The middle and upper mostly didn't have to. So, of course, the Hooverite idea of, of, of uh, keeping calm and carrying on and allowing, allowing the, the, the tide to come back in without intervening blasphemously in the economy in a way that uh, our, our ideology doesn't allow uh, was amenable. But for those actually suffering uh, and who had been taught that they had a democratic say in government – and that they could vote for things yes. to be different, <laughs> that answer didn't work. Uh, and so in the face of an unprecedented public pressure, uh, Hoover and his party, even in that context, uh, were unable to meet the challenge. And the Democratic Party was there to be, to, to be shaped now uh, by this new coherent demand that previously had been absent. Uh, and Hoover tried to address the issues of the depression, but in a way that corresponded to his views of limited government, uh, which meant that large scale redistribution and government intervention were anathema. And so uh, they tried to do things like uh, raise agriculture tariffs to boost farmers. Just uh, you're a Republican when in doubt, raise some goddamn tariffs, uh, turning into the smoot Holly tariff. If everyone has seen uh, Ferris Bueller's day off. Yes. Oh yes. The smoot Holly tariff. A tariff bill, the Hawley Smoot Tariff Act, which anyone raised or lowered, raised tariffs. An attempt to use the tools that they had. Hey, Mm -hmm. we're Republicans. Put up the tariff. Didn't work. Refused, crucially, to leave the gold standard, which would have allowed them to increase liquidity in the system, which is what it needed, uh, because that would have been collectivism. Uh, And they ended up. The, the closest thing to redistribution they could come up with was the Reconstruction Finance Corporation providing government-backed loans to industries, uh, when, and which was, of course, filled up with conservative financiers and was uh, just another uh, dip in the trough for capital. Uh, and, in all, and while this is happening, 
Hoovervilles are filling yes. the countryside. The bonus army is marching to DC. We'll get to that in a second. And the and Hoover uh, is fundamentally incapable of doing anything other than going by uh, the book as he and everyone around him understood it, which is that there were sacred lines that politicians could not cross if they wanted to still consider themselves American. Uh, I thought a, a perfect encapsulation was that was you know the anathema of providing any kind of direct federal support to individuals. Uh, but the assumption that that was okay if the states did it. Yes. Uh, which was something that uh, a position held by Coolidge, who took fairly pro positions on things like the eight hour day and anti child labor law, when he was in Massachusetts yeah. politics. Right. But when he got to be president, he was like, no, the federal, gov- the federal government. The federal government do that. can't do any of this. Are you mad? Yes. And here's where we see, uh, here's where we see capital as democracy becomes more uh, nationalized and as democratic organization becomes more. Uh, uh, more effective, the retreat to federalism from people who had, until that point, affirmed central uh, government authority throughout the 19th century. And so through all of this, Hoover, a retiring Quaker who is shy of public speaking, uh, he did get the brunt of the blame. Uh, people started saying Hoovervilles for shanty towns. Hoover blankets were newspapers used for warmth. Hoover leather was cardboard covering for holes in shoes. In June 1932, the Bonus Army a group of as many as 43,000 World War I veterans and their families encamped in D.C., demanding immediate payment of war bonuses that were scheduled for as late as 1945. Capitol Police, attempting to clear the encampment, opened fire and killed two. Acting amidst report of communist agitation, the U.S. Army led by Douglas MacArthur, along with his chief aide at the time, a bright young man working his way up the Army's administrative positions named Dwight Eisenhower, was eventually dispatched and cleared the encampment with a force including six tanks. To say the least, this all did not look good. No, it's a bad her. look, sending, uh, sending the Cossacks against war heroes. Yes. And so Hoover was done. A classic perfect president type guy, as we've said now many times, a a genius administrator who was a you know a, a, an avatar for his party's politics at the time, elected with overwhelming uh, support uh, in the popular election, utterly foiled by the range of his experience that led him to office and his inability to alter it to the situation and the huge fucking situation he was presented with. It was a hell of a situation. It was a thing no one th- thought was even possible at that point. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he is very much sort of a mirror of uh, Wilson. Wilson was undone. Wilson, imag- a master of the, of the technology of government in one respect, uh, was undone by his, his uh, overshooting uh, ambitions, Hoover, by uh, his technical limitations of imagination. But also, of course, even if he'd wanted to do something significantly differently, he still would have been chained to a Republican Party, which was constitutionally incapable of carrying out the reforms that would have been necessary to ameliorate the situation meaningfully. But so what about the Democrats? I mean, we obviously know what's coming. The four-term wonder. The hell on wheels, as I like to call them. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, but we're exiting this era of absolute Republican dominance. Besides the obvious answer of a depression so great we have to put great in front of it, how do we get from basically the same as Harding, James M. Cox, to goddamn FDR, from some of the Democrats' biggest blowout losses to their all-time biggest blowout victory in the course of a little more than a decade? So we've talked about how the party is this uh, at the grassroots, a coalition of Southern Protestants, Northern Catholics, which leads to the nomination of Al Smith in 1928 and some absolutely hysterical explosions of anti-Catholic sentiment nationwide. Uh, yeah, the the fear mongering during 1928 is is really great. Uh, there was a sincerely held like panic belief among the people uh, that not only would Smith take orders directly from the Pope, but the Pope would be literally moved to America to rule here. And uh, one account had that Smith had plans to bring the Pope over the moment he won the election on a battleship and build a fortress in Georgetown for the Pope to rule from. Uh, and intellectuals would joke after the election that Smith had sent the Pope a one-word telegram saying, unpack. But it's important to note, as I said earlier, that even with this as the preeminent hysterical view of American Protestants, American Protestants in the South overwhelmingly voted for this ticket. And it was <laughs> the only place that he won because the brain of the party now was in the cities. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that is where the momentum of the country in general was because of the 
process of urbanization that had led it to become an urban con- culture country with a mass uh, media mass, and technology of uh, mass communication and transportation. And so at this point, the urban democratic machine was not allied around uh, the labor movement. It was around patronage right. networks. Uh, but those patronage networks, much more than most other forms of political power in this country, were directly connected to working class concerns because the constituency of these machines was the working class of the cities. And so that mechanism, which brought Al Smith to the governorship of New York, where he, while Hoover was dithering, was carrying for, forward New Deal style, po- style policies in New York right. as governor of New York, even before the Great Depression, uh, is able to, to uh, exert power through this mechanism that is not designed around class politics, but can be used to express class uh, and uh, class desires. Uh, and it is the context of the Great Depression, this massive collapse of this disillusioning with capitalism, uh, which leads to uh, a mass uh, mobilization of working, both uh, working people and unemployed people uh, by groups like the Communist Party mm-hmm. uh, and the Radical Congress, uh, Congress of Industrial Organizations, which splits from uh, the AFL in the 30s. Uh, as part of a greater uh, process of radicalization of the working class. And while in another country, this movement would have expressed itself in a working class party, Mm -hmm. a actual socialist party, a labor party, in the context of America, where the pre-existing pre-class parties had maintained themselves and had both kept portions of the working class within them along geographic lines, and in the context of the Republican Party refusing to offer any real alternative to continued immiseration, the Democrats end up being the vessel for working class ambitions, both organized and unorganized. And so the working class, through its organs, uh, asserts an unprecedented influence on the Democratic Party and moves it away from uh, its position as just another post-progressive corporate party into one that had at its tables of power representatives of the working class for the first time in American history. And, uh, and what allows this to happen more than anything is massive mobilization at the grassroots by workers who start wildcat striking Mm -hmm. like maniacs and start uh, mobilizing and start organizing. uh, And many of them joining the communist party, many others of them uh, joining the democratic party uh, as a vehicle for uh, a class project. And the Roosevelt promise of the New Deal was largely uh, opaque. It had very few specifics when Roosevelt ran against Hoover, but it was understood as an alternative. And that meant that everyone in the working class who understood themselves as working class people and who wanted to pursue a project that asserted working class uh, rights in the face of the bipartisan uh, capitalist system that they were part of, were able to direct that into the Democratic Party because doors that had been closed were now being opened by uh, opportunistic political operators such as New York Governor Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So again, we'll get more into the uh, 1932 election next week uh and it is a dramatic victory so i want to give it its own time but uh long story short hoover gets clobbered in 32 uh and he becomes a uh, e- even more embittered conservative trying to wedge himself into 1930s politics uh railing against fdr's plans uh and living into his 90s and dying in 1964 uh, a bitter uh, conservative crank to his very end yeah someone who was overcome by history Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's many examples uh, in, in this country. Hoover's last writing, reportedly, was to Truman, who had slipped in the bathroom six days before his death. Uh, this is Hoover writing, quote, Bathtubs are a menace to ex-presidents, for as you may recall, a bathtub rose up and fractured my vertebrae was when I was in Venezuela on your world famine mission in 1946. My warmest sympathies and best wishes for your recovery. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, just bathroom wishes to former expat presidents. Yep. So here we leave another presidential era uh, largely considered to be filled with who's and them's. One usually fairly skipped over between the much hotter World War I and the much more tragic Great Depression. 
Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover, uh, I guess popularly considered, if they're considered at all. Uh, Three stiffs just keeping the driver's seat warm while the corporate thrum of the Roaring Twenties does all the actual steering. And then all we learn from the time is when one of them fucks up, the stupid teapot dome. But maybe this era is better defined by the trends away from the spotlight. The dramatic remaking of the Democratic Party, the collapse and rebirth of the labor movement, racial and xenophobic tensions surging again to the surface, the swelling insurmountable victories of pro-business republicanism hiding a fatal flaw at the heart of the system. Hegel said that the owl of Minerva alights at dusk, (laughs) meaning we can never really understand our historic moment until it has passed. And that is all well and good for us as observers, but it's a whole other thing when you have to actually embody history in the form of power. And so figures like Hoover uh, really do uh, encapsulate the, the sort of latent tragedy of that, is that, that you may think things are one way, but you won't find out until it's too late to do anything about it that it's the other way. And so join us again next week when we take this uh, chaos and collapse and perhaps imagine that there could be a, a different way. There's some got to be, be another way. way. A, uh, some kind of um, uh, new way to organize the relationship between fresh. citizens. Uh, uh, fresh. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, original. Yeah. Some kind of uh, new, a new deal. New deal, maybe. We'll see. See you next week. Hell of Presidents is produced by me, Chris Wade, with our co-editor, Nick Claus. Our theme music is by Nick Diamond. Additional music for this episode is by Tyrant King, whose music can be found at soundcloud.com slash tyrantkingmusic, and Blackout Princess, whose music you can find at blackoutprincess.bandcamp.com. Our episode art is, as always, by Branson Reese. Join us next week and enter to win a brand new deal.